to another Great Minds Drink Alike podcast. Um, and if you've been with us before, you know I ask really brilliant, smart, cool people to join us um, so we can hear their stories, their strategies, and of course, so we can all have a drink. And so uh, right along with that theme, I have got my good friend, David Rendell. Um, I, call, I call him Dave. I'm going to have to ask him about that because I think, you know, I don't know if David, you know, some people get a little picky about that stuff, but he's the big pink guy. So if you've ever come to one of my events like boot camp this year, producers club, I know you've seen him on stage. He's always decked out in pink. Um, so as we, as we're letting people kind of get on, I know we're streaming this on YouTube and Facebook and all the interwebs and stuff like that. Uh, go to the comment section. I'm looking at it right now. We're having a little bit of a technical problem with the plugin. So you, the replies aren't working, but, <laughs> but you can post. So post where you are in this big, great world of ours. What are you drinking? What's going on to so do that? Um, make sure you find that subscribe button. Make sure you subscribe. You like us. Um, give us some love there on social media. That kind of helps with all the algorithms and whatnot. And so, you know, maybe we'll show up higher ranked than the Johnny Depp trial, which will never happen. But, you know, one a girl can wish, a girl can wish, right? So um, so with that said, hey, I've got, I've got, like I said, I've got Dave on here. You know, I'll just read this quick, bi this quick bio. So Dave Rendell has spoken to audiences on every inhabited continent. Dude, you got to step it up. I mean, maybe go some, like, is there a continent that's not inhabited? I'm just- Penguins are not having a lot of conferences down in Antarctica and it's cramping my style. They're not doing, they have a low budget after the pandemic. They don't have a lot of event budget. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Cause I was like, I think every continent, now that I read it, I'm like, every continent is inhabited. It's, I don't, anyway, but I'll, it, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so his clients are really cool people like the US Air Force, Australian government, Fortune 50 companies like Microsoft, AT&T, United Health Group, Fannie Mae, State Farm. But the coolest event he's ever spoken at is the TMT event, okay? Let's be very, very clear. We 100%, have that's 100% true. It's true, it's true, I, you know. Um, and he is a certified professional speaking professional, um, was a leadership professor. Professor, I see I'm drinking. Um, <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> That's part of the bit. You're supposed to slur your words a little bit or else it wouldn't seem right. Yeah, hit it. There we go. Prove it to them. There we go. I am totally drinking right now. Okay. Um, and I started early. Like, let me show you something. Look at this bottle. It's near empty. Okay. It's near empty. empty. Stand up comedian, nonprofit executive. Oh, and Mike's on too. See, I'm really yep. good at this. You, you know, when I drink, okay. I, I've got it all together. Dave's going to completely criticize me for but that's actually the best introduction i've had on here so we're yeah. stepping it up yeah oh and mike yeah oh uh, yeah and mike's on yeah yep. okay i'll take so, it I'm, I'm not even done reading your bio but you know what tomorrow i am being interviewed by dr nito cobain president of high point university at the national speakers association and look at the shit show i'm doing right here like i can't even read an intro all right it, American dream people. All right. You can be uneducated, unable to speak. I mean, I'm only fluent in like swear words and sarcasm, you know, and you'll, you'll find out by the end of this, which one I'm really fluent in. Um, and between presentations, you run, you don't run ultra marathons, do you? An Ironman triathlon? That's what it says. On the bio. <laughs> wow. That's hurtful, Dave. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Wow. She's met wow. you. You obviously do not that's do that. That's a lie. Yeah. That's a clear lie. In, yeah. wait, 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 wait. It says in between presentations. I'm calling bullshit because I don't think you're going to jump up off this presentation, go run an Ironman. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm just There's saying, a lot more right? time than like that seven minutes after a presentation. <laughs> There's sometimes a gap, you know, yeah. a few days. Yeah, yeah. Dave yeah. only speaks like twice a year. So <laughs> yeah, he's got about 180 days. I do between. a big one in March and then a big one in October. And between that, it's all exercise. Yeah. Right, right. Only on continents that have people living on it, inhabiting. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, and he's um, he, he has four books so far, maybe more coming in between, he's very busy with these ultra marathons, but in between that, so he's got the four factors of effective leadership, the freak factor, the freak factor for kids and pink goldfish. And I think you've got a new one coming out or on, um, I, and we'll, we'll ask you about that. Anyway, I think you got a new one coming out. I'll just, let me just say that. Okay. So what, and, and what are you drinking? Cause I'm, I'm drinking Turley, which is a, look at this, it's empty. 
um, which is like a Zinfandel. It's actually really good. What What are you drinking? I went out special, a little pink drink from Starbucks, right on on the nose, on brand. Well, cheers, my Keep friend. Mike, what are you cheers. drinking? So I, I got some gas station wine because I kind of forgot about this. And it is a uh, peach, a high-end peach wine. <laughs> high-end peach. Yeah. It's called Love <laughs> Olivia. So Went down I, to Georgia, got some peach alcohol. <laughs> yeah. You're going to get period after drinking that shit. Uh, I don't even know what that so, is. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's lovely. The, yeah. the, the bouquet right. on it. Yeah. It smells it's, like sugar. He can also use it as fuel for his vehicle. Okay, it works. Gets rid of rashes. <laughs> um crossing <laughs> my fingers anyways um so uh, lord okay what are we doing all right oh okay dave <laughs> all right so um no like on a serious like you so i met you um well, i guess a, a year or so ago we had you come and speak at our producers club meeting um i have had you mc boot camp uh we did a speaker training and this is to be real this for real i you did that speaker trade it was like last Ju- was it last july you did that speaker yep. training or something yep. like that right and my msp clients raved about it they they had they came to me and over and over again said that was like literally the best training they've ever been which was kind of hurtful you know <laughs> saying that to me but yeah, so we we've extricated. We we fired those clients. I'll work on those testimonials next time. I'll work. I'll try to set those up a little better next time. Yeah, no, but they said it was it was really good. And you know, your presentation at our boot camp or um, producers club event, which was all about the freak factor stuff. If you guys haven't seen it, it's a great presentation, and uh, I think that's one of one of the keynotes that you deliver. It's just so well done. I mean, it, you know, there's two ways when when you do a presentation. The way I look at it is, I, I look at it. You know, there's the the content, which is whatever it is you're talking about. But I also kind of like, from my viewpoint, I always look at like what is he doing and why is he using that story and how is he using humor and how is he building the the examples and stuff like that. And you're really amazing at it. You're very good. We actually have you coach our. Uh, better your best finalists at boot camp when they come in and and whatnot. So um, no, I mean it's just it's just phenomenal. But so Dave, like, what would you say? I'm just kind of curious, like, because you you do all these things, you do coaching, you're speaking, you write, you you do ultra marathons. I mean, what would you <laughs> what would you like if someone said, what do you do? Like, if, like you meet somebody at a cocktail party and they say, what do you do? I mean, what what is your answer to that? Yeah. I'm a professional speaker. I mean, that's what I would tell them. And then they would say, oh, a motivational speaker. And I'd say, sure, because I don't want to have that discussion. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I mean, that's what I do. Um, I thought I'd clear a few things up from the introduction. Number one, Dave is fine. Mm -hmm. Um, Dave, David, I'm not not one of those people who gets picky about that. You know, there's people who are, but that's not me. Um, Fun, small world fact. I taught at a little college called Mount Olive College in Mount Olive, North Carolina. And that's where Nito Cobain went to college for two years when it was a yeah. junior college and only had two years. Um, I didn't teach him, obviously, we're at different uh, times, um, but he's still a huge sensation there. And everybody, there's, it's a very small school. They focus now primarily on adult education, um, and they do have a four-year school now. Um, and, um, and they're a university now. I think they're working on, they have some master's degrees now. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, he's still a sensation and he's only two hours down the road in high point. So a little small world um, there. I'm always in MC mode. So when you're introducing me, you're like, I have really cool people on, you know, only the best rock stars. And I thought a perfect bit, you can use it on the next person was, but not this week. I thought thought that's where you're going. I thought you were just setting it up hard. And I thought she's about to just destroy me, but we couldn't find any of those people. So we got Dave. Dave And also I was in this head and I'm like, oh, do I be hurtful? Because sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. Sometimes people think that like when you say things like that, they, they could, I'll get an email later. It'll be like, why are you being such a bitch? And, you know, it, I mean, or just whatever. So I was ready. I was I'll doing stop it emailing. So. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, you know, I just got yelled at by, if Charles Swihart's out there watching this, you know, I just got yelled at. He, he said, um, they, he doesn't call like what I do coaching. He calls what I do bitching. He's like, after you got done bitching at me for like an hour two weeks ago he's like I finally got a fire under my ass and I closed three deals I'm like okay good all right so well I think there's two kinds of people I mean it it, with personal training 
with any kind of coaching with leadership in general, um, I think there's two kinds of people. There's people who like they want their personal trainer to sort of tell them they're good enough and give them a hug and tell them they're fine and not push them too hard. And then other people, that's exactly why they hire that person. They're like, if you're not screaming at me, then I'm going to sit around on the couch. If you're not yelling at me, I'm going to quit early. Um, and I think people, that's the beauty of it. People say, this is the right way. This is the wrong way. I think people have to find that person who does the things that they, that they need. Right. And that's part of the freak factor, right? Is it something somebody thinks is terrible? Somebody else is like, no, that's what I need. That's what I'm signed up for. Exactly. Yeah. It reminds me there was a guy and I, I tell the story a lot as a guy and I can't remember who it was, This is, but it happened years ago. And, um, guy comes up to me after an event and he said, you know, Robin, if I wanted a woman to point out all my failings, where I'm not good enough, where I'm falling short, you know, I could have done that. I could have stayed at home and my wife would have done that for me for free. <laughs> right. Um, and so, you know, I get it and you're right. I mean, everybody has to have their own, um, their own approach and, and as a coach, and I think everybody has to find somebody that they feel comfortable with coaching them, yeah. you know, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I, my, my philosophy or my standpoint is, as a, as a coach, I ha my, you're paying me to be tough on you. You're not paying me to be your friend to, you know, now every once in a while, yeah, client needs a little break. They need a hug. They need encouragement. I'm not above that. I'm not saying kick their ass all the time. But if I feel like somebody is is dragging and they're not doing what they could be doing, you know, yeah, I'm going to lay into them because that's yeah, that's what it is, you know. But uh, and then, yeah, if you don't want that, if you want somebody who's going to say, hey, it'll be all right, let's go get a drink and let's go chill out, let's go on vacation, you know, you should take the weekend off. Like, right, I'm do like, less. Not only am I not going to push you, let's just forget about it and decide it's fine. I mean, I think about it in terms of, you know, people get on Mike Krzyzewski, the coach of the Duke Blue Devils, you know, for yelling and swearing and screaming at people and getting in their face and maybe even getting a tiny bit physical. Those are the best players in the country, the best players in the world. They could have gone anywhere. They went there because they knew that maybe they wouldn't work as hard if somebody wasn't pushing them to the brink, if somebody wasn't screaming at them, if somebody wasn't challenging them, um, and if somebody was giving them a free pass. And so I think there's something to be said for that because we get to make those decisions. Nobody, nobody, at least as far as I know, nobody's forced to go to your program, right? So if somebody's like, that's not me, then there's other people out there. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, th I think that's what we got to look for is find, find the fit between who we are and what other people need. Yeah. And that's why I have Mike, cause Mike's the nice guy out of us. You know, he, he's the one that'll like, you know, be nice. Is Mike people. on this call? Did we have, yeah. is he, <laughs> he he's, yeah. he's drinking the, the pink. Yeah. Yeah. I've there. got my Mount Al Air Love Olivia wine. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's grown in Tennessee. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hope. I, I think it's in a bathtub in Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> Inflation, right? It hits your it hits your uh it hits your alcohol budget pretty hard there. You're got you've had... well, this was now cheaper than gas, so yeah. we're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and has mostly the same properties. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> exactly. So uh, all right. So you know one thing I want to ask you because you know, there's a lot of people watching this, they might not know who you are. I know that's amazing and hurtful. And but you know, there's probably like a couple people out there who never heard of you. So I want you to talk about because you talk about the freak factor, and that was the, the talk that you gave at our producers club meeting. And what was really funny is at the end of that, you you're like, hey, I'm gonna give my my stage presentation to show you what a good presentation is, and then we were talking to them also at that same time about how do you, you know, about delivering a presentation like that. So it was like the, the two lenses and nobody wanted to talk about how to deliver a presentation. <laughs> they were just like asking you about the freak factor and your viewpoint. Yeah. So just for those who don't know who you are, talk a little bit about the, what is this freak factor thing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, you asked who I was and I said, professional speaker, and that's, the part of the story, right? I was in trouble my whole life because I couldn't sit still, be quiet and do what I was told. I was in trouble with my teachers. I was in trouble with my parents, eventually in trouble with employers. And everybody's message was, you've got to dial that back if you want to be successful. And we all hear this in business. We hear this in the work that we do. We hear this from family members and friends who are genuinely usually trying to help. They have the right intentions. But the message is like, you're great. Just dial it back a little bit. Like moderate, reduce, eliminate these characteristics. And then, you know, be just the right amount of these things. And so for me, it was always 
You don't need to be talking so much. You don't need to be talking so loud. You don't need to be so excited about things. You don't need to dominate conversations. You just need to learn to sit still, be quiet, and do what you're told. And now I'm a professional speaker who gets paid to stand up, paid to talk, and paid to run my own business, not to do what somebody else is telling me to do. And so I learned that my weaknesses were strengths, that all these things that people thought were bad about me were actually good things. And then I started amplifying them, turning up the volume on them instead of trying to turn them down. And that's what I teach other people to do that with your kids, with your spouse or your partner, with yourself, even with your business, you know, that's pink goldfish is company weaknesses can be strengths. Like we just talked about, oh, that lady's too pushy, somebody else. That's exactly what I need. I need a push right? Um, I was at an event one time and this woman had this kind of close cut uh, gray hair and she was in her mid fifties and she was starting a consulting business. And her son told her, if you're going to start a consulting business, you got to dye that hair. Uh, That's not going to work. Nobody wants to do business with an old lady. And she sort of had the ultimate freak factor comeback. She said, I'm selling gray hair, right? I'm selling my experience. I'm selling the work that I've done. I'm selling my background. I'm not trying to look younger. I'm selling the fact that I am older, right? And so that's what we're talking about with the freak factor. And it resonates with people because it does it. It changes the way you deal with your kids. It changes your relationships at home. It changes the kind of work you look for for yourself. Um, I just got a nice gift from somebody the other day. Um, but it's somebody I don't know that well. And so I, I sent them a message. I was like, where did that come from? And they're like, well, I saw your presentation five years ago. I started turning up the volume on the things that everybody told me to turn the volume down on. And now I'm running this coaching business and everything's going great. And I just wanted you to know you had a huge impact, you know, on a one hour webinar. So it's a message that really resonates with people. And the reason I'm so passionate about it is because I get to do the thing that people spent their whole life telling me not to do. Um, and now I make a living doing that. And I want other people to have that fulfillment, that freedom, the happiness that comes along with that. Yeah. It's, it's like you're giving them permission to be themselves, you know, and yep. that's the thing, you know, I think I wrote about this once in an article in my, in my newsletter. And I said that, you know, with kids in particular, the most dangerous thing is the need to be liked and the need to fit in because kids become less of who they are or they, they turn bad because they get in a crowd that wants to, you know, like an individual kid, you know, young guy might not do, you know, set fire to a building, but you get five teenagers together and, you know, all of a sudden they're going crazy and they're just starting to do what everyone else is doing. And it can, it can really lead you down the wrong path. So I think that's, I think that's why your message resonated so much with our members is again, you're giving them permission to be different, to not fit in. And not only not just be different, but use that as your strength. So I don't, can you give an example? I don't know. I know you're giving an example for yourself and the lady with the gray hair. I mean, do you have any examples like from our members uh, or, I mean, it doesn't have to be, but just. No. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was on Facebook just a couple of months ago and I saw Mike Bazaar um, post about this and it was really cool. He's like, we've got this guy and uh, he does really well. Um, in fact, I should just, I'll just pull it up while I'm thinking about it, but I'll tell you one other story from him at the same time. So he said, look, we have this guy and he's a little pushy. Um, and so we tried to stop him from being pushy and, um, that didn't work and he's a really good guy. And so now we put him on projects. We're being pushy as a plus, right? Mm -hmm. And even pushy is a, just a negative term, right? You don't have to call it pushy. You can call it assertive. So right. that's part of the idea of the freak factor is that every so-called weakness is actually just a negative way to look at a characteristic that's actually positive. So another one from, from Mike Bazaar, um, and I'll just read it directly because it's so good. He said, one of our engineers can solve any problem you put in front of him. He's amazing. But, and this is where it always goes, right? But he tends to ignore everything else while he's working on the issue, right? Hyper-focus, right? Hyper-focus. Now, meanwhile, we criticize other people for being too distractible. <laughs> so then that's the other thing that's a catch 22 about the freak factor no matter what you do someone's someone's got a problem with it right robin's not pushy enough robin's too pushy there's no there's no anyway but he said so instead of trying to fix him which is what most employers do what most businesses try to do what we do in relationships he said instead of trying to fix him we're finding ways to let him use that superpower to tackle bigger and more involved problems and then shielding him from interruptions. So not only do we, and we call that alignment, we help him find alignment, but we also help him avoid, stay away from, and we, 
things that don't fit. And we struggle with that business. Oh, sure. I want to help people find their strengths and do things that they're good at. But I mean, this is just the job and you just have to do certain things. And I just can't let you not do that. Um, and so now they deliberately gave him something where hyper-focus is valued and they allow him to stay away from situations where he would be interrupted instead of saying, we really like you, but, and then you make this whole big deal. In fact, a lot of times people get fired for that. We just can't deal with someone like this. And the job just requires you to handle interruptions. So that's a great example of, and Mike does it with his business too, right? It's bizarre solutions. It's BS, right? And so then he's got these stickers, you know, about BS, which again, most people would, you know, pull away from, oh, I don't want to have that negative connotation. Some people are going to think that's inappropriate. I don't want to do that. And he really leans into that. And that makes his business very memorable and very attractive. So that's a good example of it being done on an organizational level, and then also being done, you know, with the way you manage people. Yeah. You know, when you said, when you said that, one of the things I, I, I talk about, like what we teach is direct response marketing, but to kind of put my own spin on it, I, you know, I call it educational direct response because in my world, if you're really good at what you do, an educated prospect is your best customer because someone who knows what good IT is, they're educated, they understand the value of it, they understand what to look for in a good IT provider or whatever, they should be easier to close. So we we call it educational direct response. And um, Mike, you'll think this, it's Dave, I was working with Dave D and he shortened it to EDR and I just like, when I looked at that, I was like erectile dysfunction, like immediately. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm selling ED to it. Maybe erectile dysfunction marketing, you know, well, well, you can't get your marketing up. I don't know. Just maybe I'm drinking. It's just a bad I, I used to work on it. I yeah, used to help with the Chamber of Commerce in a little city in, in Wisconsin, and the executive director just insisted on calling herself the ED and putting ED on everything. <laughs> and I was just like, I don't. I don't know if she's seen the commercial with Bob Dole. I don't think if she knows what's happening here, but she just, she just, she just insists. She just loved that acronym and she just stuck with it no matter, you know, no matter what. All right. Well, Mike, work. What do you think about that? Good, bad? Um, <laughs> I don't know even what to say to that, quite honestly. Yeah. All right. Well, so, we'll just yeah. keep reading it, your- it hits too close to home, Robin. All right. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, but Mike's saying he's a, he's the president and he's a client. Also, a client. <laughs> I, I was also an executive director. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so tell me this, what's up with the pink? Where did the pink all come from? Yeah. So I have three daughters and um, no sons and even the dog's a girl. <laughs> um, I am married uh, to a woman and the dog's also a Bichon Frise. So even if it wasn't a girl, it's a girl, right? Yeah. And you're a girl would when you identify are... as a girl. Yeah. 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 Even the boy dogs identify as girl dogs. Yeah. So um, basically um, I, and a lot of my early work was in human services, social services, my undergraduate and masters were in counseling psychology. So I started the world in nonprofits um, and social services. And so speaking and working was almost always me and a lot of ladies. Some of the classes I would teach, I was the only man in the room. A lot of the speeches I did, same thing. And so, um, in fact, the first talk I ever did was to a group of moms and grandmas about parenting. Um, and I wasn't a parent and I was the only man in the room. So I knew my credibility was, you know, just sky high (laughs) when that presentation started. And so, I basically started telling these jokes about how I'm not a woman, but I'm getting closer, right? How I'm not a woman, but I'm actually moving very, very close. And in fact, maybe on the other side of, you know, halfway there. And so um, it just was a fun way to connect with people. And that's one of the things you need to do in speaking, right? If you're completely unrelatable, right? You, you have to look for ways to bridge the gap. That was one of my favorite things from Nito's book. My coworker, again, she was a huge fan. She'd been there for like 30 years. She may have been there actually when he was. Um, And she gave me a copy of his book. And one of the things he said in there is that the biggest mistake most speakers make um, is that they put themselves up here as basically perfect and entirely competent and flawless and amazing. And instead of connecting them to the audience, that actually causes most people to go, oh, so I could never be like that. So none of what this person says is relevant to me and they tune out, 
And so we talked about the importance of being self-deprecating, admitting failures, talking about challenges, admitting the lack of perfection, which is my whole message that weaknesses can be positive, but very specifically in this. And so that really helped me um, with my whole presentation because I was telling certain stories about like being passed by a pregnant lady in a marathon um, and people loved it but I didn't know why it was working so well. And then I read his book and I'm like, oh, it's because it takes, okay, Dave's done all these things. And like, especially as a teacher, I'm up here educationally and I'm helping people who are trying to get to a certain level. And it makes me more normal. It makes me more relatable. It makes, makes me able to connect with people. So I started telling more of those stories, but the, the, the turning into a woman stories just turned into this thing. People loved it. Um, they thought they were hilarious. And so when I had to pick something to be different, um, I started wearing some pink shoes just to kind of embrace my womanhood. Um, and people will be like, ah, pink isn't a woman's color. And you're like, look, when the gender reveal parties change, let me know. But when people <laughs> see pink, they think women. It doesn't mean women only wear pink or anything like that, but that's the color we associate. Um, and so I started wearing some pink shoes and that was a big hit. Um, and people would stop and talk to me about it. Um, then I started with some pink socks, then I added pink pants, and now you've seen the full-on pink suit. I have pink tattoos, so no one can ever say I'm not wearing pink. My wedding ring's pink. So it just turned into a thing where if I post something, um, I finished my first Ironman, which I didn't do, obviously, because you told me earlier that I didn't. But, but when I did an Ironman that I wasn't doing between I'm presentations. I'm saying you didn't do it in between speaking. That it was yeah. like it was written, it was in between speaking. <laughs> like that i'm like i don't know that you're yeah but i was in just between, wearing like wait a regular in between presentations yeah in between presentations yeah. anyway you were saying so anyway you, what, when I, I finished my first iron man some people were like good job and other people were like you're not wearing pink you know, like that was their initial response to it. So it's just become a way that people remember me. I've had people hire me um, saying they asked their staff and they're like, hire the pink pants guy. So it's now it's so now the answer is because it causes people to do what you just did, which is ask me, what's the deal with the pink? Right. And, and again, you know this as an entrepreneur, isn't it nice to have people coming up to you to ask you what you're up to instead of you having to chase them and try to tell them what you're up to. Right. So it's just an attractor. I mean, it causes, it's a conversation starter. It's also, you know, makes things more memorable people. You know, I tell people there's a lot of people who look like me who do what I do. And pink is a way to stand out from a whole series of people like me who cross stages at conferences all over the country. And people go, I remember that pink because they're certainly they're not going to remember Dave. That, or Mike, um, that's not, those aren't names that just boom, really stick in your head. Um, and so it's a way to stand out and it's a way to, to get people's attention. Yeah. It's funny because they won't remember your name. You're right. But they'll remember you were all dressed in pink. Um, yep. so. How about the, the, the breast awareness, the breast cancer people, are they coming after you for uh, stealing their color? Cause you know, they kind of own well, that. First one. of all, I do. I am not enough of a woman. I still do promote breast awareness. Um, I'm still a big fan. Um, that is something that I am a big fan of. Um, the breast right. cancer awareness people actually, <laughs> big I think fan they of thought breath. when I, in my nonprofit days, I taught a session on persuasion and I saw a really cool billboard one time that was a great example of something I wanted to teach. Um, and it was from the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. And I was driving to the airport in Chicago and it was basically just um, a woman from here to here um, in a t-shirt. Um, and it said, we only care about one thing or depending on how you look at it, maybe two. Um, and the whole goal was to get men to care more about breast cancer and not think of it as somebody else's problem. Basically the message was, if you like these, you care about what we do. Mm -hmm. And so it was an amazing, um, quick, simple advertisement that also acknowledged what's really going on, people are gonna look at a, at a billboard with breasts on it. Mm -hmm. So this was, I couldn't get a picture of it and this was before cell phone cameras. And so I contacted them on the phone and I was like, hey, you know, my name is Dave and I want your breast billboard. And they were not having it, right? I just kept, I think pretty soon I was talking to Susan G. Komen's sister who started the thing by the end. And I had to like go through the whole thing and finally they were willing to send me the image um, but yes, I do. In, in October, I've dyed my hair pink. 
Um, I donate to breast cancer awareness causes. Um, it's another huge connection. It's in the book, Pink Goldfish, because it's also a great way that they've turned a color into a, when you put pink cleats on an NFL football player, people see that in ways that they don't because it's incongruous. It doesn't fit your image of what should be happening. So we talk about them in Pink Goldfish, how they've basically taken a whole color and changed people's minds about what it means. And people will ask me that all the time, even when it's in April, they're like, "Are that is that for Breast Cancer Awareness Month? And you're like, well, if you knew how months worked, um, then you'd know it wasn't, but um, later it will be, you know. <laughs> exactly right. Okay, cool. So tell me about, you've got this, um, so it's like this, you got a new new book. So you got the Pink Goldfish 2.0, right? Yeah. Which is, when did that come out? That came out last summer. So we put out Pink Goldfish a couple of years ago. Then during the pandemic, we just added a ton to it, added a bunch of new stories and examples, um, added some new features to it. And then we did a, a book tour last summer. We did about 11,000 miles traveling around the country in my completely wrapped pink Honda Pilot. Um, talking to people about pink goldfish. Okay. What, what, t- give me a quick summary. What's, what's that? Yeah. About? That's just the freak factor for marketing and strategy, right? So your business has weaknesses that are also strengths. So one of my favorite examples is Buckley's cough syrup. They're a Canadian cough syrup company. Um, this is good for your show because I know I can swear on your show. So Buckley's tastes so bad that when I was doing the presentation one time, there was a Canadian guy in the audience Um, It was a small group of like 20 people, but he came in later um, and um, I put Buckley's up on a slide and he just shouts out like it's not discussion interaction time. He just shouts out that stuff tastes like shit. Like he had like PTSD from how bad Buckley's tastes. And it's a Canadian. So when a Canadian interrupts, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so he so it tastes terrible so much so that people have like bad memories from it. So. (laughs) If you're trying to expand into the American American market from Canada, you're going to make it taste better. You're going to new and improved. You're going to cherry flavor, bubble gum flavor. You're going to completely reformulate it. You got to do something to fix it. Um, and what they did was they flaunted it. And that's what we talk about in Pink Goldfish. It means to parade without shame, to be unapologetic about who you are, right? And so what they did is they made these commercials, these fake blind taste tests, where someone would try some Buckley's. And then they would try like trash bag leakage, you know, is what it would say. And the person would always prefer the trash bag leakage or the sweaty gym socks or whatever it was. And their message was, if you think it tastes bad, it tastes even worse than you can possibly imagine. Right. Um, And we're not trying to fix it. And basically it's kind of the no pain, no gain. They're like, people swear by it and add it it tastes awful and it works. And their basic message was it works because it tastes awful. And they were able to increase their market share by 550% from 2% to 11% of the market by basically selling how bad it tastes unapologetically, unashamedly. And so that's one of the keystone stories in there. But once you start looking for them, they're everywhere. I mean, there's a guy on TikTok who's the number one Uh, with followers on TikTok. He has more followers than anybody else on TikTok. It's a dancing and a singing app and probably a little bit of flashing things and other kind of app. And all this guy does um, is is sit there quietly and make silly faces while people do stuff from other videos. He's the number one. Um, There was a lady on America's Got Talent. I'm always sending these to my co-author, Stan. This lady on America's Got Talent the other day, she took nasty comments that people posted after her America's Got Talent uh, music, and she took the the nasty comments and turned them into a song and sang it as her bit on America's Got Talent, right? (laughs) That's an example of being unashamed. Like people are telling her, you're trash and you need to fix it. And she's like, I'm awesome. And I'm going to take your words and turn it into another song that you hate. And so- that's what we're, it's like you said earlier about having permission. So I want to give people permission in their business to also say, we don't serve those people. We don't do that. We don't, we don't care about making those kind of people happy. We don't offer that kind of service. We don't work in that region. We don't have that kind of expertise. We call that withholding. Another great example is uh, Alamo Draft House Cinema. You would love this. Um, they, uh, they'll bring you food and alcohol. Um, while you watch a movie and they were started in Austin, but they have rules, no talking, no texting, Um, no coming late. If you come late, they don't even let you in. But if you talk or text, they give you one warning, then they kick you out. Mm. Um, 
and they take it seriously. If you're under 18, you can't go to the movies at all unless you're accompanied by an adult. If you're 15 to 17, you have to take a class and pass a test if you want to go to the movies, right? These people are serious about their movies. So this lady goes in Texas. She talks and texts. They give her a warning. She doesn't listen. They kick her out. She leaves a nasty voicemail. And what do most companies do when somebody leaves a complaint voicemail that do you want a coupon? Can we offer you a free one? We're so sorry. Please don't post this on the internet. What can we do to make you happy? That's not what they did. They asked their lawyers, can we use this? Mm -hmm. Their lawyer said, yes, you can, because she knew she was being recorded. They mm -hmm. took her voicemail, they transcribed it, and then they played it as a public service announcement at the beginning of the movie and said, we will kick you out too if you do what this lady did. We're serious, right? Um, so like at the end, she's like, so thanks for treating me. And they're like, you're welcome. Thanks for not coming back to the Alamo. They also put it on YouTube to further antagonize her um, and got more than a million hits of people listening to her voicemail um, and watching what she said. So people love to say the customer's always right. Alamo Drafthouse proves they're not. And it's okay to say we're not here to be the movie theater for people who don't know how to handle themselves in the movies. If you want to do whatever you want, go to most movie theaters. If you want a different experience, come with us, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So Pink Goldfish is giving people permission to say, this is my business. I want to do it my way and I don't have to serve everybody and everybody isn't right. I can do what I want. Yeah. I, I mean, that's kind of like the same thing when I teach uh, niche marketing, you know, and I say, you got to be for someone and you're right. Everybody tries to appeal to everybody, appease everybody. Um, I don't want to say we only serve CPAs on my website because yep. you know, if we do that, then everybody who's not a CPA won't do business with me, which is not the reality. And they try to just fit in and be plain vanilla. And the thing I'm always trying to tell them is actually, if you are for someone like a small group, let's say a small subset you actually get more leads and more sales because you're for someone versus being this plain vanilla, whatever. I don't know. Well, and that's the tough lesson. You have to be for someone. And the best way to attract some people is to repel other people. Because one of the threats this lady made in her voicemail was I'm going to tell everyone. And what I tell my audience is, is that's perfect. Because when she's telling everyone how terrible you are, what actually probably 50% or more of people are hearing is how amazing you are. Oh, lunatics like you who don't know how to behave aren't at that theater. I'd love to know the name and address, right? So when she's bashing the company, she's actually praising the company and she doesn't realize it. So I think that's part of what we're saying in there is, like you said, everybody knows they're supposed to have at least a target market. Mm -hmm. But that means there's somebody who's not only not your target market, but that you shouldn't or don't want to be working with. Very few have the confidence or courage to actually push away the wrong people. But when you do, it's very attractive to the right people. A Planet Fitness does it. They say, basically, if you're ripped and you're fit and you lift heavy weights and make noise, we don't want you. Basically, if you're fit, we don't want you at Planet Fitness. And then CrossFit goes in the completely opposite direction. They're like, we'll take anybody. We're sweating. We're on the floor. We're doing whatever needs to be done. It's hot. It's difficult. It's painful. It's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be clean. It's not supposed to be quiet. And we're not worried about whether we hurt your feelings. We want, it, we want to push you. We want you to be better. And better isn't whatever you are right now or you wouldn't be there. And so those are two opposites we talk about in their planet. Fitness has a market. CrossFit has a market. In fact, CrossFitters call Planet Fitness Planet Fitless. <laughs> but in Planet Fitness, in their commercials, they make fun of fit people. They yeah. repel fit people in their commercials and they attract a different kind of person who wants an environment that doesn't make them feel bad about whatever spot they're at now. And again, that's fine, but that's not everybody. Some people know I'm never going to change unless there's people pushing me to be better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, and you just said something, I think that's the big fear everybody has is like, you know, oh, I'm going to get a bad review. Uh, oh, someone's going to, you know, and, and there are people who really, you know, when they get burned, they will, or they feel like they're getting burned or, you know, dismissed or whatever, they will, they will try to wear you out on social media and they will try to, um, to burn you up and all the rest of it. And I think, um, like you said, it just takes, it, it just takes confidence in, you know, we're doing the right thing and we've got to repel people. I mean, we just, um, like, you see Hey Hey, do you know who Hey Hey is? No. 
No? Okay. And his batteries are dead. I, I meant it like it's like a kid's toy. So like when they put batteries in, you know how they put them with screws. So like people like me won't eat them, the batteries, you know, whatever. So he's like, you, and usually like, see, like he's like his batteries are. Eh. He's trying. He wants to. Yeah. Well, basically he, he, this is from the movie Moana. And, and he's just like a dumb chicken. He's constantly follows around. She's trying to get rid of him. He constantly follows around, gets in trouble, gets in the way. He's just, a, you know, he's a dumb pluck is what he is. Right. And so I, I just wrote about it in, in my, and I have him here. He usually sits over there for some reason. I, I put him here. I was talking about him today. Um, it's a reminder that, you know what? One dumb cluck in your office is enough, more than enough. And I've already got one. So you got a client, you got an employee, you got somebody who's a dumb cluck, who's really messing up your day and screwing you up, causing you anxiety. Doesn't, and, and you know, it, it's just, it could be even a client or somebody who just doesn't fit in with your DNA, your. Right, it doesn't have to be bad. It's just not the right spot. It's not the not right the, fit. Exactly. Right. So well, let's, let's talk about social media a little bit. Cause you brought that up and I think that's a good one. So let me give you a couple of, of fun examples. So first of all, there's an MSP that I know um, from before I even knew about MSPs um, from meeting you um, where I did the pink goldfish presentation and I asked people in the audience, you know, have you done any of this or do you have any examples of doing this? And the one that the guy does is they basically take all of their customer feedback that they collect constantly and they have it run down the left side of their website. Good, bad, they don't filter it, they don't manage it, they don't do anything with it. It's just a live ticker of what people are saying about them on social media and using their own feedback gathering tool. And they feel like if they're transparent about what's happening, we call that exposing in the book. People are so afraid to, to put it out there. They wanna manage it. They wanna, you know, then everybody does it and then we know everything's fake. So mm -hmm. that's one way to handle it. Another example on social media is Snowbird in Utah. They're a, a ski resort. They took their number, their one-star reviews online and they turned them into advertisements and they took out two page spreads in ski magazines. And that's all that was on there. One star, you know, with next to four empty stars and then a picture of something happening at the resort. And then the person's review without an explanation or anything. So it'd say things like too advanced. We felt like we were taking our lives into our hands, no easy runs. But what they know is their customer doesn't want easy runs. They powder too deep. There's no such thing as powder that's too deep. They're out there to take their life in their hands. That's exactly the point of it. And so all they did was take those one-star reviews. And not only were they not afraid or ashamed of them, they turned them into advertisements. And then there's one other example of this company called Bado Bistro, where this guy was tired of getting fake, what he thought was fake bad reviews and felt like Yelp was trying to extort him. So his goal became to be the lowest rated restaurant on Yelp. And he started offering discounts on pizza if people would give him a one-star review. And he actually succeeded not only in becoming the lowest rated restaurant on Yelp, but he sold more pizzas in a day than he normally sold in a month. And he actually started to destroy Yelp as an organization. Their company has done nothing but decline since he started doing battle with them because he started drawing attention to some of their questionable practices. Yeah. So those, those are three examples of where you don't have to be afraid of that stuff. You can actually use it to your advantage. And again, the right kind of customer, too expensive, too much stuff I don't need, um, all these, fine. But there's other people who wanna pay more, who want everything offered, who want it all in a monthly package, all these kinds of things. There's a way to sell that by telling people what you don't do. Yeah, set a standard, stick with it, 100%, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mike, I hope you're taking notes. Is there anything we can do with some of those shitty reviews we got on Yelp? Because we got some really bad ones on Yelp. Well, I just emailed our list asking for shitty reviews. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. Good. Yeah, I've, that's that's what I took away from David. So, yeah. No, what, what I'll tell you one way you can use it is just post it. It's a great way to get attention. Just put it right out there because, again, it's transparency. So some people, it, but it's also an attention getter. Nobody looks at that and goes, "Oh, they're just bragging." They look at that and go, "Why would somebody post that?" So, for example, somebody gave me a two star review, like on my children's book or something. <laughs> now, a lot of people will say the kids book like changed their kid's life. It is, it's and fantastic. so when yeah. I put the two star review on social media. People just went nuts. People started posting positive reviews to counteract it. 
But people also started just posting hilarious things and it drew a bunch of attention back to the book um, because um, it, it caused a reaction in a way that if you post a five-star review, people hardly pay attention because of course you're going to do that sort of thing. So that's one way to do it, the, especially if you do it strategically. If you know there's a profile of people that just don't fit with what you're doing, they don't like it, they won't like it. It's not bad. It's just different then, like you said, no easy runs, powder too deep. So if you can see, I would encourage you to go through it. And if you find some patterns of people who don't like basically exactly what you're selling, they push too hard. They want you to do too much. It required too much change. I wasn't ready to make those adjustments. And they weren't just telling me I was good enough. They weren't encouraging enough and telling me I was already where I wanted to be. They were mean basically in pushing me to be better a lot of people are going to go, oh, that's what I'm signing up for. Again, I don't want a personal trainer that gives me a hug. I want a personal trainer who threatens me if I don't do three more push-ups, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you can find a pattern in there that you see as the opposite of the people you're trying to attract, it's just a great way to get people's attention. And it is so uncommon. I mean, Nebraska, after four years of being the 50th state in America in tourism out of 50 states, they came up with a new campaign called Honestly... Nebraska is not for everyone, right? <laughs> and people were talking about it in Australia. Stephen Colbert was talking about it um, on The Late Show. He spent his whole monologue talking about Nebraska's tourism slogan. Nobody even knows their own state's tourism slogan. But by saying, we're not for everyone, we're not perfect, we're not New York, we're not even Colorado, they had people going, well, am I one of those people? Well, don't tell me where I can go. And they saw this massive increase in interest in visitor guides and website visits and tourism. I mean, Stephen Colbert goes, he ended his monologue. He leans in real close. He goes, Nebraska, are you okay? <laughs> and they tweeted, they tweeted online. They said, um, no, we're not okay. That's Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're going back and forth with Stephen Colbert on Twitter, you're doing something right in your little state tourism board. But again, they did it by acknowledging we're not perfect. And people are hungry to hear that because we live in a world where everybody pretends to be the best. individuals and organizations. So people don't believe anything because everybody's like, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. And so nobody knows what to pay attention to. So you stand out when you're like, well, we're not. Yeah, we're not, we're not. well, I, you know, in, in copy, because I'm a copywriter, so a copy, uh, like a sales copywriter, where I write marketing, influential marketing pieces, whether it's a script, a sales letter, a website, so forth. And one of the principles really, if, you know, if you're, if you're an advanced copywriter, one of the things that you know to do is it's admission of a flaw. And, you know, so because it elevates the truth of everything else. So like, you know, years ago, I had a friend um, and this is when I was like a budding, you know, copywriter learning stuff. And so she had a family Italian restaurant and they, they did, they had great food. Cause I'd go to, I used to teach aerobics like seven days a week. And so after class once a week, went twice a week, I'd go over from right from the gym to her restaurant, sit at the bar and, you know, they'd make me whatever, you know, bring it. It was fant fantastic, but it wasn't fancy. Right. And like the chairs were, were kind of beat up a little bit and they were different chairs and the tablecloths were these checkered, like not perfect, you know, not plat, like kind of not plastic, but just, you know, it was, it was a little, it was very homey, if you will. Right. Uh -huh. And I remember her just complaining. She hated Olive Garden, like hated it. She's like, it's microwave friggin' shit in the, and like, and like, and she's right. You know what I mean? Like she just, um, and you know, she would complain and complain. And I said, you know, you really ought to advertise that if you're looking for, you know, a Real. plastic, you know, yeah. dinner out, they go to Olive Garden. But if you're looking yeah. for from scratch, a homemade Italian from Jen, cause she was Italian, her mother, you know, family was Italian generation, generation where we've got, you know, real tablecloths and the chairs aren't perfect. It's like eating at your grandma's kitchen, Italian grandmother's kitchen. And that's a great um, example. Your grandma had mismatched chairs. Your grandma yeah. had a tablecloth with stains on it. Yeah. 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 And, and the crochet doilies and the, <laughs> the, the, the Jesus, the plastic, you know, like, and all that, like, if that's what you want, then this is where you want to be. And she thought that was the craziest idea, you know, but, but I think it is, it, you know, like with our program, I mean, I just spoke on stage at an event and I was selling and I said to guys, I said, right from the stage, I said, look, 
you know, if, if you are not interested in being a real entrepreneur, and I don't mean that to be hurtful. I'm saying like, if you're not growth minded, you don't want to, you don't want to scale your business. You're not wanting, you don't want to put the work in to really learn marketing, put a marketing plan in your place, because this is going to be difficult. It's going to be overwhelming. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take a couple of years to get this right. I don't have a quick hat. I mean, we have a couple of tricks here and there, but we don't have, this is not a bag of magic beans. It's going to take work. It's going to take dedication. You're going to spend some time and money. And if you're not really in it to grow your business and you're just looking to get a client or two here, a couple of quick hacks, we're not, I'm not for you. And I yeah. live, like I said that, you know, and I know there were a couple of people who did not buy because of that. And I thought about it later. It's like, so part of me is like, well, shit, if I didn't say that, maybe they would have bought. But the reality is they would have bought maybe, but then very quickly have would have become that negative Yelp review. And dissatisfied because you yeah. sold me something that wasn't real. I and mean, I think that's a great way because not only is it, it's a good technique. It's also just honesty, right? If you're I mean, like yeah, this. It wasn't a technique. It was the honest yeah. truth. Yeah. The, guy, the guy at Bado Bistro has a big chalkboard. Um, the guy who wanted one star reviews and they're just not, it's a very much like you were talking about. They don't have table service. You order at the counter. There's no place to eat there. It's just takeout, but they also don't do it's in California. They also don't do a lot of the things. So I don't know if you've ever been introduced to people who want to dip their pizza in ranch uh, dressing, but that's a huge thing out there. So he just has this chalkboard. It says no ice, no oil, no free bread, no ranch. And then it even says at the bottom, Costco is one exit down. They have a 20 inch pizza for $8 and 99 cents and they have tons of ranch. So he not only says we don't, he's like, they do and go ahead, right? Go ahead. If that's what you're looking for, I'm not that. And I'm okay with that. I'm selling you something that's different but it's authentic Italian pizza. It's not what you think pizza is. And right. so that's, again, an educational thing. If you're interested in having an experience that you're not used to, this is the place. If mm -hmm. you want that thing you became familiar with, with tombstone pizzas from your freezer, go down the street and work with them. And so I love that, even just that, that attitude, again, of unapologetic, unashamed, this is what we do. This is what we don't do. This is who we're for. This is who we might even be against. That's a powerful way because think about the kind of business you have to have. If you try to be for everyone, your life is just going to be miserable as you try the impossible task of pleasing everyone and making everyone happy, even when they have unrealistic demands of you versus the power that comes from that's not really us. And if that's not for you, I also have a good enough program from Robin for marketing where I can find the right customers. So I don't need to be subservient to the wrong kind of customers and have them ruin my life. Exactly. Exactly. So tell me what, what else is, what's this amplify thing that even were, is that the thing you were working on with some of our members? I know I got in an email like loop. I don't, maybe it wasn't that, but you're, you're yeah, I've been working on. Yeah. They started it during the pandemic because you know, you couldn't do professional speaking during the pandemic. Um, and so um until people started going virtual and that kind of stuff. But there was kind of a lull for about three to six months where people weren't ready to go virtual, but they also couldn't legally have their events or whatever in certain places. So um, I started working on an assessment. So it's basically a freak factor assessment where um, you can see how your strengths and weaknesses are, are related. And then it shows you how to amplify that quality, shows you how to find the right fit, find that alignment. It shows you how to stay away from situations that don't fit and how to partner with people who are strong where you're weak. So it just takes the freak factor concept and operationalizes it for people. So they go, okay, well, I, that sounds cool, but how does this affect me? And you say, okay, you know, you're persistent, but you're stubborn. People are going to tell you to be less stubborn. I'm going to tell you to be more persistent. People are going to tell you there's something wrong with you. I'm telling you that it's awesome. You're a relentless persister. Here's two pages that tells you why that's awesome how to turn up the volume, how to find the right fit, how to stay away from, from situations that don't fit and how to partner with people who are going to be the opposite of you and would be great partners because their flexibility and willingness to take different directions when combined with your persistence is going to make you even stronger. And so the assessment just takes those 
um, results. Basically, it's a personality test where it shows you how your strengths and weaknesses are related and then gives you advice on what to do with it. So it just takes the book and the concept of your particular strengths and weaknesses and puts them together. Whereas formerly, we do this quick assessment where people pick their strengths and their weaknesses, and then it would show you how persistence and stubbornness were connected. And then there's the book. And if you want to try to put the, but as you know, some people will do that and other people will be like, that's a lot. And I don't even know. And I've got other things to do. So what this does is it just takes all that information. It puts it together. So it just says, here's the three or four defining features you have. Here's situations to move towards. Here's situations to move away from. Here's people to partner with. And the amplify piece, that's why we call it that is really key. It's like people say you're too messy. Maybe you're not messy enough, you know, turn up the volume, start breaking things, start smashing things, start ripping things, start tearing things. And, and again, people, some people might immediately go, oh, that sounds ridiculous. And then what do they have now? They have those like riot rooms that they sell where you can go to these places and just destroy things. There's actually a business that's built around people's desire to just blow shit up. Right. And so it sounds even a little ridiculous when I was writing it and but it doesn't sound ridiculous to people who've lived their life that way and who need somebody to tell them, you know what, don't be more organized, don't Marie Kondo your life, um, just get messier and see what happens once you give yourself permission, you used that word earlier, and I love that, give yourself permission to be messy and see where that takes you when you're not constantly fighting it. And when you are organized, Marie Kondo the shit out of everything, they drill it down, be a minimalist. So it doesn't tell anybody to stop being them. It's just go to your corner and be comfortable with that. Don't feel like you have to come to the middle and dial it back. Yeah. Are there really demo, Mike, maybe we should do that for the next producers club meeting. It's coming up next week. Is there I like, like it. Like, like, I don't know in Nashville. I mean, closest I think we have is axe throwing, but we can probably get like Jeff Johnson's car and demo it. No, but these are, it's like a room, like you can go into yeah, like, pristine, there's like TVs and yeah, like, like a pristine, like, like British dining room, like all the, all the, the, the crystal and the doilies and the <laughs> tablecloths and the candelabras. And they, they give you some glasses and they give you a helmet and they give you a vest and you just go in there with sledgehammers and crowbars and metal baseball bats and you just what, absolutely I'm, I'm google it what what like what would i google Demo? i think they're usually called riot rooms is i think oh, what right. they're called there's smash city rage room experience rage that sounds... room that's the word i had the wrong okay. r rage room yeah it's a rage room i didn't know that was a thing check it yeah out. it's awesome yeah they actually tried that uh, Robin for marriage counseling. So like I said, I studied uh, counseling psychology. And so what they tried for a while is they thought when husbands and wives are mad at each other, that maybe if they could actually beat the crap out of each other safely, it would decrease their anger and allow them to move on. And so they would dress them up in these like big pads, you know, like they use kind of like for dog training or for like fighting and say big padded helmet, big padded arms, and they would let them just wail on each other. And what they found is that anger isn't hydraulic. In other words, it doesn't go down when you express it, it actually goes up. So the more <laughs> they hit each other with baseball bats and stuff, the more they started thinking this would be even better if the person wasn't wearing pads, right? And so they learned that that was not a good, um, but rage room, you're taking it out on something that cannot be I'm hurt and you're not damaging your relationship there. So. I didn't know that was, this is like, you know what I'm telling you, if anyone listening to this is an MSP, you absolutely need to sponsor this and bring clients in and let them smash. Like, you know, like what was yeah. it? What was it? Um, it's not the, is it the office? What's the name of that movie where they, like yeah, they, office, space. office space. Yeah. Where they yeah. take it out they, on the they, printer. They uh -huh. out, they just smash. Now it's, so that's, I love it. It's a theme. Yeah. I think you have to do it. I think it's a themed MSP rage room where it's all the things, <laughs> oh, servers, better. computers, Wait. printers, Wait. all the things that so destroy their this. lives. And here's the thing. We go to all our sponsors that are like the, 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 that have devices. And we tell them, if you don't want your shit in this room, you got to pay me $20,000. <laughs> <laughs> It's the oh, anti-sponsorship. Yeah, I anti like it. Sponsorship. If yeah. you don't want your logo on things that people are beating the shit out of, yes. you have to pay me money to keep it out of the room. Yeah. yeah. Smash right. City Rage Room Nashville. Yep. See? Holy, it, got an axe to grind. Yeah. Come smash some shit and get it out. I love that idea. Like, I know that's not what you were talking about, but now I'm all like, I'm thinking, like, immediately I'm thinking I totally could make money with this. Do you know what I mean? We could do this and have, and if you're an MSB, like I would, I would do this 
maybe once a month you host this event where where new customers can come in and smash all the the computers and the printers or the whatever yeah. like pissing them off right that's you way know? more fun well, than is, just bringing it your is old what printer. we're talking about yeah. though does it say smash some shit right on their website it says yes yeah, matt and here in nashville it's like smash city rage room try and say smash city like yeah I've but I mean, even if you say shit on your website, you you know you're antagonizing a certain population and you're also going, you're, there's some other people who are like, oh, hell yeah, this is where I want to go, right? So that's a great example of it's pushing some people away, but it's pulling some people. And there's definitely people who would think that was wrong, inappropriate, all those kinds of things. And these people are building a whole business around it. I think it's fantastic. No, great. We should, we're, we're totally going to do that. Okay, cool. All right. So do it for all the road shows, it should be an activity <laughs> on all the road shows. So I can, so Mike and I can just do it every time. All right. You got it done. Okay. So um, I know we're, we're, we're like over time. We're like right on the hour, right here, on. Whatever. but um, so, all right. So very cool. So real quick, the Amplify test, um, do they go to AmplifyTest.com? Where, where do they go to check Amplify that out? Amplifytest.com. We're still, um, we're still working on it. It functions um, we're making some improvements to it. If people want to do it, um, yeah, go there, check it out. It has like a sample report and things like that. Um, and if they want to take it, they can just contact me and we can get them some codes so they can get in there. Okay. And then one quick question that um, Paul Tracy wanted to know, uh, what was your favorite Muppet and why? I think my favorite Muppets were the two old guys who made fun of everything. <laughs> Right. Cause like, that's me at anything, even my kids, you'd think, um, you know, the kids would be okay with you being immature, but like my kids are more mature than me. So like we were going around touring my daughter's new school, right. And we're going from classroom to classroom and I'm making fun of what the teachers look like and making comments about the room. And I'm whispering and my daughter's like, dad, be appropriate, grow up, like stop whispering. We can hear you. Um, so I think those are my favorite Muppets. They're, they're commenting on everything and being, being, um, being inappropriate and, and critical and judgmental and all those kinds of things. Yeah. So, Dave, and I know you've got to go, but I'll share a quick, story so like after you spoke is mike on this call called, is that, is that <laughs> mike hello is, can you can you hear me um yeah, yeah i'm mike um so Hi. anyways uh after you spoke whatever last <laughs> july or so <laughs> going, out the mike's trying to talk and then robin's going straight out <laughs> the bottle sorry mike, what what you saying, mike? yeah 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 I'm, I'm, yeah i hate to be nice but i'm trying to um but anyways after you spoke at producers club we had a member of the team and he said he's always been described as like a utility player like he knows a lot about a lot of things but he's always thought it was a weakness he's like i'm not the best at seo or best at facebook or this or that and he's like hey maybe that's actually my strength and then I mean, it's like six months later, we lost him from my team, but he went over to run our done for you digital division. Cause he's like, I can actually manage a bunch of specialists. Cause I know a lot about these five areas. I don't know everything about anyone, but, and then really flourish with that. And they love working with them cause he knows it all. So like, that was a big thing. I mean, we've heard from dozens of members where it was just a big aha, but like that your biggest weakness can be your biggest strength. And um, so it does mean a lot to people and really resonates with a lot. That's, so. so that's a perfect example. And I think that person actually talked to me when I was leaving boot camp last time. But, um, you know, that's actually, there's 40 profiles in the Amplify tool, but there's, there's 41. And the 41st is if somebody doesn't really hit on, I'm not really a lot of that or a lot of this or a lot, I don't really have a lot of big weaknesses and strengths. Then they're what I call a versatile generalist, right? And they get that report, right? You're a jack of all trades, master of none. And people are going to tell you that's bad, but here's how it's good, right? And here are situations where being a jack of all trades can be really advantageous. Look for situations, and you just described it, where knowing a lot, a, a little bit about a lot of different things is actually valuable. And that's even perfect. That also is affiliation. You partner with people who are strong where you're weak. So now this person is managing specialists. I know the big picture and how all these things fit together. And now I work with these people who go deep on these different things. And that's the perfect combination, right? And so that's what we're talking about is not only do you turn up the volume on who you are and find the right fit, but then you partner with people who are complementary. And the problem is those people are usually so different from us, it causes conflict. So we often fight those people instead of connecting with those people. And that's a perfect story of how it works in real life. I love that. Yeah. And after I took the test, I think it told me I know nothing about a lot of things. So that was, that was really close to his. Yeah. 
So that's very that's, zen. That's, that's very zen. You're keeping yeah. it open. <laughs> Yeah. You're ready for something new. There's nothing really in there. That's openness, right? So yeah. open-minded stuff can't stay. I'm just right? here with my peach wine. Like, yep. yeah. My bathtub no, my peach wine. wine. I think the peach wine probably burned some of it out. There's probably yeah. a little bit of a, yeah, destructive capacity there. <laughs> okay. So amplify, but kids can take that. I'm, I'm curious, like I might get my kids to take that. That'd be, that'd be cool. So well, there's a, if right now too, if people go just to drendel.com, um, there's the kids book is a free video on YouTube. And then there is a kid's version of the assessment where they can pick their strengths and weaknesses. And it's designed especially for kids where they can pick their strengths and weaknesses and see how they're connected. Cool. Um, but that will be a version of amplify in the future. Uh, 13, 14 year old could probably take Amplify. If they're younger than that, go to the other, go to drendel.com and there's a simple free PDF there where they can just download it. And there we've done that activity at events and stuff like that. And it really resonates even with young kids. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Funny, it's funny story about my kids. Like, so this is pre pandemic. I was, they allow the parents to come in and have lunch with your kid. Right. So um, you know, I, I show up and I'm in the cafeteria before they allow a man, I got there a little early and I'm sitting there waiting for Jamie to come in. And, and, uh, what was really funny is she's got her tray, right. And she walks into the lunchroom and she sees me and she totally sits down at two tables away from me. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, it's on. Right. So I just ignore her and I start making friends with all her friends. And we are having, like, I, I brought, you know, but they're not supposed to have candy. I brought all kinds of candy and candy bars <laughs> in my purse and I'm like a drug dealer. I'm giving it to the kids and we're all laughing. And my, my, my daughter is dying of like, and yeah. we're getting yelled at by the lunch lady. It was great. So. Yeah. I showed up at lunch with pizza one time I was invited. Um, and I sat down by my daughter and her friends and it went so well. She said, dad, they loved you. They want you to come back all the time. And I wanted to brag about it on Facebook, but there was no way to do it. Right. Teenage girls love me. <laughs> um, I'm a real hit with teenage girls. I get along really well with preteen girls. Um, yeah, leave that I, I, there was no yeah. good way to, to communicate that. So it was a proud dad moment, but no way to kind of share it with the world without signing very, very, very bad. That'd be weird. Yeah. Good, good choice. All right. Look, I saved a little bit, one last little like swig here, um, in the glass so I could be professional or something who cares. Right. Um, but it was a great interview, Dave. I love having you around. You're, you're phenomenal. Our members love you. And I mean that sincerely. I know we're, we're joking and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, I do appreciate you and, uh, cheers to you and to you, Mike, with your peach wine. Yes. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. So that's it. Now I got to go open another bottle. Very cool. All right. Perfect. You got to head start your pre-gaming for Friday night. <laughs> I'm just getting warmed up. All right. I appreciate you guys. Thanks, everybody. Make sure you hit subscribe. Give us a like. Give us a comment. Um, and uh, make sure you come to one of one our- One star review. One star one review, star please. reviews. Keep it low. Keep it Keep low. It low. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Appreciate everybody. Thanks.